maybe we can start. Good morning to everyone. Welcome to the Water Inspire session, a sea view, which I would, I would say that's quite nice continuation to the workshop that started, that's been held this Monday on the boat on the university campus. And uh, my name is Andrei Abramich. I work in Joint Research Center in Institute of Environment, Environment and Sustainability in the unit which is very much guilty for the, this conference in the Digital Alert and the Reference Data Unit. Please, come in. Uh, today I will, I will have this special honor to chair and present in this session. And before I start with, uh, with the first presentation, I will, I will give you the presenters some kind of the rules. Please try to be inside of the 15 minutes. Try to give the time for the other presenters and try to give the time for the questions after. So please try to be inside of the 15 minutes. I think everybody would prefer that we, it had uh, questions after the presentation to be, but if the presentation goes too long, then should we go on the end, okay? <coughs> the first presentation is related to the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, implementation and INSPIRE, ro Inspire Roadmap, it's done as well with uh, Wanda Nunes de Lima and Paul Smith. So, Marine Strategy Framework Directive is adopted 2008 and its main goal is to, to, to obtain for the all European seas good environmental status or to preserve this good environmental status. So, to implement this, the member states should provide some kind of administrative reporting which started in 2012, when the member states had to provide information about the first analysis of their waters. And they, after this, they should provide what is the good environmental status, because good environmental status is not easy to understand and to establish what is it. And finally, what are the environmental targets for the member states? The reporting is going to continue in 2014, in the October, when the member states have to report what are the monitoring programs which are there established. And in, 2000, in the end of 2015, member states should provide the program of measures and which area are designated as a marine protected area. The cyclus is finished and it's closed in 2018 when the member states should provide a report on the progress of implementation. So here you can see there is a reporting, a, a report, a reporting obligement for the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and here we have Inspire Implementation Roadmap. So if we merge this thing together, you can see here, there's no microphone with me. <laughs> So, uh, you can see here that for the reporting for 2012, the member states for the spot hill data which they provided within the reporting sheet, they should provide the network services, discovery and view. For the next reporting for the 2014, member states within the reporting sheet should provide all the network services, it means discovery, view and the download. And for the last two reporting requirements, a member states should provide the report, uh, the network services, and finally, the date, spatial data should be developed inside of the Inspire, Inspire data model. So, how should member states provide? How should marine community provide this uh, data? They need spatial data infrastructure, of course. So, there are two ways how can marine community use the spatial data infrastructure. First one is that they, the marine community could talk, could have agreement with the national community, inspired community and to use already established national infrastructure which is compliant with Inspire. Or there is another way to develop marine, marine spatial data infrastructure. 
as it done. Or it could be some kind of combination, but we know that we are dealing with, uh, I don't know exactly how many states are in Europe are implementing European uh, Marine Directive, but there are lots of states and then we have probably different state of knowledge between this community. So this is, could be one of the way. Please. So what should be reported? In 2014, as I said, we have uh, member states should provide report about the monitoring programs. They should report the fact. Please. They should report the reporting sheets, which have all the details about the monitoring programs. But as well, they should also provide the spatial data. Spatial data should be provided using the SPIRE data model. And because the, all the details are inside of the reporting sheet, we believe that model that is inspired at the model will be enough. For the reporting requirement of the program of measures and marine protected areas, which comes in the end of 2015, as well, the member states should provide reporting sheet with the all details. But for the spatial data, we believe that area management, which is the inspire model, it's, uh, it's uh, quite adopted for program of measures and uh, protected sites data model could be also, it, it's uh, also adapt, could be adapted for marine protected areas. And we also believe that these models, even basic, do not need uh, extension. So what is also member states has to share beyond uh, the reporting? There is a uh, in marine directive, there is a, there is an article 19 which specif specify that the member states should provide the old data which are coming, which they've been using for the, for the assessment, and they're coming from the monitoring programs, and they should be available for environmental agency, European Environmental Agency, and in accordance with Inspire Directive. So this means that the member states within the reporting should provide a raw data. This is a quite a big task for the member states. So how they should do it? In the 2014, member states should provide, as I said before, the monitoring programs using the environmental monitoring facilities model. And this model, inside, it has observation and measurements model. So the member states to provide this data series or to provide the raw data should not provide the new data, should update the environmental monitoring facilities data, spatial data. This is the idea. But not the old data which are provided for the marine threat, marine directive are the data series. We, hope we have also biodiversity data which for which we should use the species distribution and the habitats. And when we check the quality descriptors of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, and there, there is 11 quality descriptors of, of Marine Strategy Framework Directive, each quality descriptor, quality, quality descriptor has a, its own monitoring program, which is divided on the more monitoring programs, of sub-programs. So we count about 40 and 50 monitor sub-programs, and we believe that more than 50% could be used, could be uh, modeled with inspired data model using the, these themes, observation and measurement, species distribution, habits and biotopes, without any extension of the model. So this is the technical concept. And this technical concept should be tried, and this, come, this leads to the concept of the marine pilot. It is a project about it is a project of European Union location framework and uh, interoperability solutions for public administration. It is also a project which is delegated to GRC and it's a part of Inspire Evolution institutional project. And this is a project which actually explores the three policies, Inspire, Marine Strategy Framework Directive, and Embonet, which is the European Monitoring and Observation, Observational Network. So the partners are in the marine pilot are DigiDigit with their ISA program and ULF action. 
digital environment with, of course, Marine Strategy Framework Directive and Inspire. And they are also trying to see what are the links with the WISE and the WISE Marine, which is going to, now going to start to be development. Also, there is a Digimare with Emodnet, which is some kind of the product of the Crossover Policy Marine Knowledge 2020. European Environmental Agency, of course, the GRC, Inspire Team, Inspire MIG, and finally, member states who has to do the work. So, I hope we will have Inspire Marine Community soon. Thank you. So, I think we can have now, if there is any question. Please. Oh, okay. You say that the model should not be extended, or you, it's. But I wonder if, you, or, or maybe it's different. My question: I would like to know what kind of use cases you have to take into account to create a model, because that will be the way how can I understand that the model cannot be extended. Otherwise, it looks like too ambitious to say that a model cannot be extended if I don't know what kind of use cases you have taken into account. I'm taking into account the requirements of the. I'm taking the for uh, this state for the to say that a model should not be extended or there is a need for the small extension, I actually analyze the requirement of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. So the thing is that <coughs> for the reporting requirements, we have a reporting sheet. And this is something which doesn't have anything to do with Inspire. The reporting sheet should be uploaded in the IONET. There we have the, all the information which is required about the monitoring program. In the spot hill data, we do not have to put any other information what we actually have. But this is why we do the pilot to see if there is some other requirement what is there. Okay. So thank you. And now I think, Gianluca, you are now on. <laughs> Please. How it works? Ah, yeah. It's easy. Right. Okay. I'm Gianluca Luraschi. I work for the European Mar Maritime Safety Agency, which is located in a wonderful town, which is uh, Lisbona. I'm talking about uh, how we are going to integrate maritime services in our, in our uh, agency, but also how we are going to provide this kind of information that we deal with, with uh, for other uh, institutions uh, in uh, in Europe and uh, uh, the member states. I don't know if everybody knows what maritime is because before to join EMS I was a little bit confused. I was thinking about the maritime is a kind of sub subsector of uh, marine. Actually, we deal with this kind of guys, which are vessel. This is an uh, optical image of the Costa Concorda incident um, close to the uh, Island of uh, Giglio in Italy, and uh, we deal with this vessel, their position, their the search and rescue activity, uh, the, the oil speed that they produce for when they ship uh, around the world. So that is our main big uh, topic. And this is a picture of uh, the uh, information that we acquire every day. We acquire around 25,000 sh ship, uh, the position of 25,000 uh, ship, and we deal also with the uh, satellite images. With the satellite images, we collect information about oil spill and also position of the vessel. In uh, about 10 years, we have set up different services, ex uh, four different services. One is a safe CNET, safe CNET to deal with the uh, uh, IIS information. We collect 70,000, uh, we, we monitor 70,000 ship per day. 
and uh, the safety net, safety net as, as a kind of exchange mechanism where we have included in, uh, in information that we acquire different subset of uh, uh, data, maritime safety, port and maritime security, maritime environment protection, and uh, the efficiency of the traffic maritime. Then we have CleanCNet with the satellite images. As I said, we detect a feature of the oil spill and we detect also vessel. And then in 30 minutes, we have to issue to the most closest uh, uh, Coast Guard that there is an, an oil spill in uh, the close to them and they have to take uh, action on that. Then we have a long range identification tracking system we deal with 9,000 vessels all around the world, our ship, U ship vessel. We track uh, where they are, if they need uh, any kind of assistance. And finally, we have a Porter State Control uh, System to support you know, inspection in a, in, a, in a port. So essentially, we create in 10 years four different pillars, four different silos. And the users have this issue. They start every day to look at different monitor and try to understand what is happening on the sea. And they got crazy, I would say. And they ask to uh, us to try to integrate information, try to f see in one screen all the information that they need to, to take action, to provide assistance, to do whatever they need to do. And on top of that, they start to ask us to create added value it's a little bit uh, similar to Inspire, if you have a look. With the same kind of principle, we try to think about how we can integrate. This is the architecture of a project that we have in EMSA, which is called IMDATE, where we essentially fuse all the data that we have, and we try to find out a new uh, set of uh, information and services for member states. In fact, what we did was to start from the beginning to acquire this data, to correlate this data, to fill the gaps, to remove inconsistencies, to, to give a better picture of uh, the maritime uh, position of the vessel. And finally, that is what we are addressing now, we can uh, create a kind of behavior monitoring system on top of that. So we can, for instance, uh, this is a good example, with the satellite images we can detect the, where the uh, position of the vessel is. With all the other source of information, we can see if one of the vessel is not reporting its position. And that's, for instance, for border control could be a use case where we can provide this information to the border control agency and uh, the border control agency can take action on it. So we design a new application, which is, a, we call it Maritime Awareness Special, where um, Coast Guard can have in one screen all the information that they need and they can select what they need, what they want in order to understand what is happening. So follow up a phenomena or whatever they need to do. On this, uh, based on this project, we start to create additional services. We have an anti-piracy support merchant fit monitoring service in uh, close to the Somalia region. We create a fishery control services for the fishery agency where they can understand if there are some illegal action, uh, some illegal activity uh, around the European Sea. We, as I said, we create a service for the border control agency where they can understand if there are some vessels that are not reporting for some suspicious uh, action uh, they position. And of course, we have a search and rescue services where we uh, provide information to the Coast Guard in order to take action in case of there is an accident. Okay, that is what we did since now. Now what we have to do in the, in the next following, let me say, that is our temporal uh, view in the next four years. So first of all, our management realized that we deal with geospatial information. It was the first time that they understood that we are dealing with the spatial temporal feature over the, uh, uh, like a vessel or a spill, et cetera. This was a good, uh, achievement so they start to understand that uh, this topic is really important. 
What then we have to tell, we, we realize as well was that uh, the process that we have in place uh, from the, the collection of the use cases, the turning these use cases into requirement and then acquire software is very long and complex and sometimes doesn't fit our need. When then we have something uh, to deploy in our system, sometimes it's not exactly what we were looking for, unfortunately. So, beside this uh, use case complexity, <coughs> there are some technical issues. We are dealing with real-time data set, so velocity. We are processing a huge, large amount of data set volume, and we are combin uh, combining different data source variety. I don't know really what big data means, but uh, if big data is a definition of this kind of stuff, I would say we are dealing with uh, big data, but that's it. And finally, so what we come up is we have to think about a new strategy how to deal with this information. And uh, we start to ask to ourselves, if somebody asks uh, a GET capability or an inspired GET, I call organizational service metadata, and uh, we have to say what we are doing, essentially we reply with a capability document, but essentially we are doing this kind of stuff. Monitoring services, response, capabi response services, analysis services, and sharing. That is what essentially we do with our stakeholders, member states or also a uh, European agency. So, just to clarify, for instance, what if in our environment is a response uh, capability, we have a, a common operation picture for OSP response, was an exercise uh, promoted by OGC last year, where based on a specific use case, which is try to identify what, what kind of information and what kind of services we have to deliver in case there is a noise peer response to put in place, they start to organize a, a document where they describe what kind of, inf what, this kind of uh, stuff in order to provide a solution. For me, this is a pattern. This is a kind of pattern and it follow one concept which is a special data services. In Inspire we have a special data services. As long as we are capable to identify pattern within the context of special data services, the better it is for an EMS uh, institution because it will be easy for us to try to procure a tool which then follow one of these one of these type of different service that we are doing. So just to conclude, so we are procuring, we provide special data services. Uh, we use uh, the Inspire infrastructure because we use a WFS, WMS, uh, all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, what we have to do is to provide a use cases, a solution for use cases which are close to the concept of special data services. We have to include in uh, our strategy a user and technology, of course, driven approach, but we have to use another strategy which is uh, mainly meant for what we call a capability approach, try to identify what kind of capability we can provide and try to address this capability following some pattern. And then, uh, and the capability that we have identified, uh, we have uh, clustered our monitor response analysis and sharing. And so based on that, we are going to procure a new set of uh, services. We are launching a procurement in the next couple of months based on this uh, concept. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Uh, Ray Bogoslowski from the uh, European Union Location Framework uh, Project. Uh, we heard on Tuesday about uh, a project called Mona Lisa 2, uh, which was uh, developing or investigating services for uh, marine uh, maritime tracking. Is that uh, something which uh, is, uh, is, is on your radar? Does that fit within, uh, uh, within uh, your, your picture? <laughs> Not really, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm interested to understand better what it is. Yeah, okay, good. Let's, let's then talk about it. Yeah, okay, okay. bye. Any other question? Uh, 
uh, Adam, you, you mentioned you have different types of service. For some of your services, did you have the opportunity to look how much the Inspire data model on production industrial facilities uh, fit with the requirements you have for your specific use case? Is there something that you can recommend in terms of implementation and maintenance to look further this data model to better fit your purpose? Okay, thank you, Vanda. That is a very interesting question. So, yes, we have a look on the industrial facility. A vessel, you can see a vessel as an industrial facility. An industrial facility that uh, move around the world every, every second. And uh, that's, that's uh, definitely something that could fit of that. But when we start to have a close uh, view of what kind of information just to have the position of the vessel over the sea because that is our extreme, we are extremely focused on this kind of information and some other attributes. So when we start to have a look on this model, we realize that to have this information uh, expressed in one of the data models of Inspire, we have to take into account several other information that for us is not, strictly speaking, something that uh, is our core business. And due to the fact that we are dealing with 25,000 vessels in, in a European sea per day, and each of those vessels report their position every six minutes, we have to be extremely, extremely careful how much, how big the information that we have to deal with uh, are. So we have to reduce as much as possible those information. And currently, I think one of the big issues that is missing in the Inspire data team is the tracking services. No matter if it is a maritime tracking service, it could be whatever you want, but as a pattern to track something over the time uh, in, uh, should be somehow addressed with a specific, I would say, data team, because it's something that has its own peculiarities. Thank you, Gianluca. There is another question. There is another question. Just quick consideration, Carmela Tardo from GSIG Italia. Uh, probably is more fit with a sensor. Could be considered a ship as like a sensor which emit data and you have to manage a sensor data. Actually, this is a good point. Uh, we have a discussion during the workshop on Monday, and we say that one very interesting, I would say, topic to explore is to, th to see a vessel as a sensor, which in somehow will help us to link two different, let me say, sector. One is a marine, and one is a, a maritime, which are different sector. If you see the vessel as a sensor, and then you can put in the vessel some sensor in order to collect information and then to provide information about the status, the uh, water temp uh, the sea temperature, or I don't know, the uh, uh, detect the bathymetry, then becomes a kind of sensor for the uh, marine, let me say, environment. So, makes sense. Yep, this is something that we are going to explore, right? Any more questions? Okay. Thank you, Gianluca. So the next is uh, a Danish Marine Spatial Data Infrastructure, which should be done by Tina Swan Colding. But she's not here. Can you, Peter, introduce yourself? Yes. Can you get, can you get this one uh, full screen? Um, my name is uh, Peter Poupier, and um, I will. What will I speak? Uh, what will I talk about for the next 15 minutes? Uh, focuses will be on the status for the work of establishing uh, Danish marine spatial data infrastructure, Danish MSDE. MSD. First, I will introduce my agency uh, to give you an idea of our responsibilities and role in building uh, a marine spatial data infrastructure. Uh, yeah. Ah, here we go. Um, 
the Danish Geodata Agency uh, are dealing with reference geodata on land, maritime and hydrographic data, sea charts, cadastre, uh, GIS and geodata for the Ministry of Environment, and the same issues for the Ministry of Defense. Uh, we are, for the time being, we are building uh, the Danish basic data distribution system, which is a cross-public uh, distribution system, and we are responsible for the national geodata infrastructure. Um, and I will try to tell you some of the activities leading up to the initiative in Denmark to build a, mar a, a marine spatial data infrastructure. Um, Back in 2008-9, we had a planning uh, cooperation in the Baltic Sea. It's still there. It's called VASAP. And VASAP uh, produced a long-term perspective for the ter territorial development of the Baltic Sea region till 2030. And one of the pressing issues was the development of a common approach to Baltic Sea marine spatial planning. Um, this initiative was brought into the EU strategy for the Baltic Sea region, um, which also included the development of integrated maritime governance structures and maritime and land-based spatial planning. Uh, what triggered the initiative uh, in Denmark? You could say, in general, an increased public as well as commercial pressure on access to or restrictions on the use uh, of marine, uh, marine resources. The second point with the EU Marine Strategy Directive. We also have the EU Directive on Maritime Spatial Planning and Integrated Coastal Zone Management. Um, what was our starting point? We had some experiences, we had some initiatives, we had some existing elements, and we have a political climate. One of the one of the Experiences was BLAST, which was the EU-funded regional project for better integration of information across the coastal market of the North Sea region, which was a project funded by the EU with seven countries working on harmonization and integration of land and sea data. I see two of my colleagues here who participated actively. Um, we have had a joint HELCOM, which is uh, the Convention on, on, on the Baltic Sea, uh, Conservation of, of Environment, Helcom Vasa Maritime Spatial Planning Working Group. Uh, on, I think on Danish initiative, we have an uh, international hydrographic organization has a working group on, on marine spatial data infrastructure, so we have some experience from there. Um, we have the ongoing implementation of the INSPIRE directive. Uh, let's see. We have uh, a rapidly developing integrated geodata infrastructure for, l for land data, which is in Denmark called the coming public data. It's called Fort Denmark, but it's coming public data, geodata where government and municipalities in joint cooperation collect, process, store, and distribute ge geographic reference data for combined uses. Uh, this is for mapping, public administration, land management, national defense, search and rescue. So th we have this system in place. We have, as you heard uh, yesterday uh, from one of the keynote speakers, we have a rapidly developing strategy for digitizing the public sector as such, uh, with one of the initiatives is, a, is the creation of basic public reference data sets, thus enabling for cross-sector use, improving e-governance. And in general, and as a political issue, we have a fast-growing demand for efficient public administration and modern transparent solutions for the interface between the public service and enterprises and citizens, which my permanent Secretary of State also mentioned in his, in his uh, <coughs> presentation yesterday. So all this together, and especially the EU Marine, um, Marine Directive, has triggered that the Danish DOJ agency, which is part of the Minister of Environment, has proposed to the other Danish authorities to create this mar marine data spatial infrastructure. And we have a group of general directors responsible for marine issues 
and that's where we have started this uh, this up. And they have now set, they have now put in place a working group which is working on recommendations, looking into the issues and working with recommendations to the general directors. And I will now go through the considerations of the working group. How to do it? Well, first of all, we need to see what data sets do we need. What is the basic purposes, users, users, and what are the needs? When you look at, and you can see some repetition here from what we just seen. What are the users' demands to data owners? Actuality, updating requirements, quality, accessibility, and performance. And performance and access accessibility is not the same thing. Um, we need to integrate this into our existing national geodata infrastructure. We want to base it on the INSPIRE five principles on collecting, updating, and then standardization of data, easy to get informed on data and services, and conditions for good, at least unlimited use, actually. Metadata, INSPIRE standards, and the Danish INSPIRE portal. Um, and we want to distribute through the existing national geodata distribution system. So that's the considerations. Uh, then what is the status of our MSDI data? I'll just show you, as you did too, some examples. What is, what is going on there? What, is, what kind of information do we have? We have a lot of information. We have a lot of activities. I don't want to explain. I think this explains for itself some of the, some of the data and some of the issues. This is oil and gas. This is kind of what information you need in an emergency situation. And it is, this is sort of a combination of a lot of data, if you've seen, if you've seen from a data perspective, a, a marine uh, space and data infrastructure. What is the status? The status is that data is collected processed and stored more than once by more than one authority. The same data is updated by several authorities. It's very difficult for anyone who wants to get into this area to actually get an overview of data, data providers, services, and specifications. A lot of data, most of the data cannot be used together. And different standards, and not even all not even all data is digitized. Um, and there is only one cross-government agreement on the use of data, which is the use of C-charts, which is every public, every government institutions and, and, and municipality can use the C-charts made by the Danish Geo Data Agency. But that's the only sort of cross-sector, cross-government sector agreement we have. So we have some work to do here. And what are our general recommendations? Um, the starting point, as I told you, will be the EU Director of Mar Maritime Spatial Planning and Integrated Coastal <laughs> Zone Management. And on the longer term, uh, we need to prepare uh, ourselves for the, for the Maritime Strategy Directive. We need to go further deep into nature and environment, natural resources, combined with navigation, defense and emergency response infrastructure planning, transport, energy, so forth, private and public right at sea, sort of maritime or marine cadastre. Uh, and for maybe first of all, we need to secure a transparency and accessibility for the, for the civil society. Um, and we need to include services that meet the demands, sorry, just, yeah, that was transparency and data accessibility. Recommendations on data, there need to be a clear distinction on what is basic data and what is derived data and related data. And the MSDIs should be able to exchange this different data. It has to be standardized according to INSPIRE and ISO standards. All data has to be accessible for all participating institutions in the way it needs to be accessible. And actuality uh, of data to comply with the user needs compliance with international standards, and then the track of history, which is probably an area where we need to improve. On metadata, 
uh, we want to reuse what we have, to reduce the cost and reuse what we have with systems. And we have the Geodata Info, which is the existing Danish metadata service, uh, where we can exhibit metadata, the catalog of services, uh, and so forth. And I don't know what AND stands for. Then technology and uh, infrastructure, which you could also call it functionality. Uh, we need to establish a facility for the authorities to view, download the specific data needed for the authorities' own systems, for their administration's planning issues, identify basic services and functionalities, uh, including background geodata reference map, and we need to establish the fact that it is the responsibility of each and all data owners to update, display, and distribute their own data, including uh, necessary services. Recommendations also technology and infrastructure. We need to have a common public, uh, or we recommend establishment of a common public view service, a portal, and uh, we need to find out how to how to control user access and rights management. Um, establish some upload, download of data, uh, and other public accessible services building on the data. But this is kind of future phase, step two. Um, governance. We need to agree on the data and standards, on the, not technique, but technology and standards. Uh, we need to establish operational policies and procedures in agreement with all the authorities and data owners, and a clear description or division of responsibilities. Uh, and we need to finance this. Who to pay for what? Uh, and all in all, this is sort of kind of three levels, data, functionality, governance. Um, so this is what we're working on. We're not there. We're working on it. We are in the process of recommending to our general directors how to establish this. Uh, we don't know yet how to, how to finance it. Um, but we are in the process. And I, I, I guess we will be there probably within this year, we will have at least some, some decisions on how to go on with this, how to proceed with this. Uh, but at least we are eight agencies working together and trying to, trying to look into how to, how to do this. And then the perspective, which I think is, leads perfectly to the next uh, presentation, uh, is to go international. We need to combine with this with our colleagues, our neighboring countries in the Baltic Sea. We need to combine this with our neighbors uh, in the North Sea, EU, MSDI. And then, of course, there is the perspective of what is going on at the global level uh, in the UN GGIM. Uh, we have uh, the actual Arctic Spatial Data Infrastructure, which I'm working with myself, uh, and other regional uh, initiatives where this fits together. I think that's it. Thank you. Presentation, any questions? Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Jon Morten Klingsheim. I'm coming from the Norwegian uh, Coastal Administration. And yesterday there was a meeting on transport network, mainly on land, but also mentioned on maritime. Is that the part uh, you are building into this uh, 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 spatial data infrastructure on, on a transport network for the maritime <coughs> transport, or is that a different yeah. entity? Uh, just, uh, just, just two things, uh, just an observation. I'm, I'm a stand-in for Tina, who is a stand-in <laughs> for Jens Peter. So I'm the, I'm the, I'm the third guy here. So I'm, I'm actually not in the working group. I'm sure they look into, I'm sure they look into all kinds of sort of activities and, and data that can be put into a, a marine spatial data infrastructure. Uh, but the decision of which, which to include is not taken yet. And, 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 and again, you have, a, you have a, at least a two-phase. You have a sort of a basic where you, 
where you include what is really needed and, 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 and that we can finance for the time being or agree on across uh, the sectors in, in the Danish government. So that's the first phase. And then you, of course, has you need to build a system that is, that is able to include these things in the future. And, and I know you cannot build a, a sort, sort of a, a, a future safe system because it goes so fast. But anyway, you have to think how to include new data and, and, and new sort of, of issues in, in, a, in a marine spatial data infrastructure. So I'm sure they they look into this. But but we are not in the we are not in the stage where we have sort of said, well, this is this is the first phase and this is the second phase data. We are we are we are. They are. I think they are reporting uh, for the time right now. I think they're reporting, and, and we are sort of waiting for the response from our general directors. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm sure they have considered. Absolutely. Any more? Uh, it's uh, Arvid Lilton from uh, Norwegian Mapping Authority. Uh, uh, you are uh, focusing on, on uh, the mar marine area to have a, s a separate uh, spatial data infrastructure, and you also say that you are going to um, to join it with the national uh, spatial data infrastructure. But uh, uh, why why is there really a need for a, a separate organization, or and um, uh, could this have been done through? Um, the NSDI organization itself. And uh, if you look a, a bit further, because this is a, <coughs> it's a thematic or maybe regional SDI with the Marine, uh, if you then, a little bit ahead, maybe get a, a transport spatial data infrastructure, it will also, that, that will be a thematic one, and maybe a fisheries spatial data infrastructure, uh, and maybe some others, uh, there would be lots of them. and, and uh, you have a more regional focus, or uh, so how will all these uh, fit together? Well, it is it is made by the organisation responsible for the national uh, geodata infrastructure, so it will be part of it. When I say we want to integrate, I think we want to integrate it in the data systems. So whatever system we have, if we, if, we have a, if we have a distribution system, we integrate it in the distribution system that we have for land. Uh, what, we are doing, what we are doing in Denmark for the time being is try to integrate the production of data and, and, and the way we do it both at sea and at land. That's a long process because you have to break up old, old traditions. Uh, so, but by doing this, you will also automatically have the sort of combination between the sort of land and the, and, and the marine uh, uh, spatial data infrastructure, but but I think but, but partly why we treat this as a separate thing is 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 for obvious reasons for for those who we address and not for ourselves because those who we address it's easier to tell them that we need something for the marine area, uh, but 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 I think in the view of the of, of the geodata agency in Denmark it's 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 uh, it doesn't matter whether it's a land or so so I I think we agree uh, we need a national uh, spatial data infrastructure that. Includes, includes the marine uh, area. It's the same functionalities. I mean, it's a, it's like the cadastro. I think, in our point of view, uh, you could just expand the the cadastro system into the sea, uh, and you can use the the basic systems that we have for cadastro. It's, it's not really a big issue. It's, it's actually very easy, uh, but it may be not that easy to comprehend for for for, for those who look on it on it from the outside. No. Any more? Thank you, Peter, for covering your colleagues. Thank you. And and now we'll have Peter Schwarzberg, who will. Sorry, he don't have it. Sorry, you didn't put it. Sorry. Mine is already on. Okay. It's yours. Thank you. So, um, my name is Peter Chu, and I uh, used to work at uh, the same place as the previous speaker, at uh, what was back then the National Survey and Cadastro, and now the Danish Geospatial Agency. But for the last many years, I worked for a small Canadian company, which many of you may never have heard of, called Caris. 
and we happen to be used by most of the hydrographic offices around the world. So this is really my kind of personal view a little bit and, and gathering of information uh, of what's happening a little bit around the world, especially outside the Eurozone. So it's not my company's point of view or information or their information, and it's certainly not the hydrographic of, uh, organization's point of view or anything like that. But I hope with this presentation to uh, give you an idea what is moving, uh, using a few examples, of course I only have 15 minutes, and also a little bit, well, what are these hydrographic offices doing and uh, why are there maybe so few of them located in this room? Because I, I see a few, but there's, there's not a huge amount of them. So hopefully um, you will have an idea afterwards. So, the fact is maybe that, and again, remember it's just my personal view, is that at many hydrographic offices around the world, SDI or marine SDI may not have the highest priority. They have other things to do. Well, if, if you look at a typical national hydrographic office, they have basically one thing they are thinking of most of the time, and that is safety. That is their mandate, that's the safety. There are some other organizations out there similar to the hydrographic office, which are not official hydrographic offices, and that's port and waterways. And they think about economy more than SDI. Now, of course, the hydrographic offices think about economy each too, because they realize that what they're doing is vital for the national economy. And, of course, the port and way of waterways think about safety too, because, well, if something happens in their waterway, there will be no economy. So, the hydrographic offices is, by international law, uh, forced to make some services available. They have to ensure that the mariners have updated nautical information available. Now, this slide here says nautical charts have to be available and they have to be updated. It could be other type of information too, but if you look in the United Nations uh, SOLAS requirements, it actually mentions nautical charts. It mentions some other printed publications too that hydrographic offices do. So there are actually hydrographic offices out there that are still making products like list of lights, which probably have very limited use for safety and so on. But the international law and the national law dictates that they have to produce this kind of data. Maybe they could spend more of the time on, on SDI, and, and they are spending more and more time on SDI, but this is what's number one on their priority. For the port and waterways, the economy or the blue economy is their priority. And just without getting into too many details on this, if you look at the three largest ports in Europe, which is Rotterdam, Antwerp, and Hamburg, well, they handle three, 30 million TEUs, which is a 20-foot container, which is probably half of the, of the full size that you may normally see. But there's 30 million or 15 million of the large ones they handle every year, which is a huge amount of containers they handle daily. Now, the majority of those containers come from China. The largest port in China actually handles alone more than 30 million TEUs per year. But for the port, this, the safety is a key issue to keep the economy going. These ships are enormous that goes into these ports. Uh, being in Denmark, um, you mentioned, of course, the triple E class by Maersk, which is about 400 meters long container. That one container ship carries more than eight, uh, 18,000 TEUs. It's a huge amount. If one of these ships hits ground or otherwise capsized outside, say, port of Rotterdam, then that will seriously impact the European economy. It will not only stop container ships going into um, Rotterdam, but even bigger ones like oil tankers, because Rotterdam is the biggest port for um, non-container, for bulk um, shipments. So it'll have a huge impact on the economy if the data is not up to date and would cause a accident. 
So, looking into some uh, examples with hydrographic offices, and I, I kind of figured the previous presenter would show an image of Denmark. So I decided kind of to go all around the other side of the globe and go to New Zealand, which is almost exactly on the other side of the globe. And uh, the Danish area of responsibility, as you saw before, is enormous, thanks to Greenland, probably not just because of Denmark. Uh, New Zealand does not have a colony, there used to be a colony, but they have a huge area of responsibility, as you can see, and, and this is uh, illustrating really the, the size on the globe that they are responsible for. They are similar size population as Denmark, a little bit smaller, there are four and a half million people. And they have an organization, thankfully, similar to the Danish Geospatial Agency. It's called Land Information New Zealand. And they are looking very much at SDI too. It's, it's a good example out there in the, in the world for handling SDI. They don't have an inspired directive as you have in Europe, but there is between New Zealand and Australia a Australian uh, New Zealand Spatial Information Council that do some cooperation in that part of the world. So what they have available in New Zealand is a through a LINS data service, LDS they call it, they have seven data themes available. It's not as much as Inspire, but they're working on it. They're very pragmatic. They are, they are making this data available as much as they can with the small organization they are, and they're trying to really to serve the industry and the inhabitants of the of New Zealand and making this data available freely. So the data is available with a Creative Commons data license. Data can be copied and redistributed and used and they encourage people to do this. They also make applications to, uh, to provide the data more to the end user, actually have small apps for the handheld devices. And they're doing all this stuff as much as they can within the uh, international standards, using OTC standards, WFS, using ISO standards like 19115, really doing it in, in an international way. And outside New Zealand, it's possible to access this data and, and use the information too. In the neighboring country I just mentioned before, Australia, um, they're doing things slightly different. Now, LINS is a civilian organization. In Australia, the Hydrographic Office is a Navy organization. And I'm not sure, but sometimes you can get the feeling when you look around the world that it depends a lot if, there is, if it's a Navy organization or a civilian organization. So how, how is that worldwide? Well, I had a very, very rough look at the hydrographic offices around the world that are registered or part of the International Hydrographic Organization, and roughly two-thirds of them are civilians, and roughly one-third are defense organizations, Navy organizations. A lot of the defense organizations also employ civilians in their organizations, but some of them are very... Um, uh, military oriented and then you will see people in uniforms all over the place and if you go to go this is not the case if you go to australia in australia you basically only see civilians but they are part of the navy and the hydrographic office in australia is not directly actually having an sdi and making the data available they have another organization in australia but interesting enough is the bathymetry provided to that sti coming from somebody called geoscience australia and not directly from the hydrographic office so is that a good example of civilian and, and Navy? I'm not sure. Uh, and it's certainly no excuse. And a lot of Navy organizations throughout the world are really trying to do something about it. We jump, jump a little further uh, up from Australia, go to Malaysia. And as you can see, there's uh, some nice uniforms there. And uh, this is the Malaysian Navy, where the hydrographic office is. So despite being a very Navy-oriented organization, they do try. And you do think SDI. They don't really have much yet in, in the term of um, providing an SDI service, but they are building up databases with an SDI in mind. They want to do SDI and they want to be part of the national SDI. And similar stories you actually see if you jump to South America. It, they, do, they do have SDIs there and the navies are part of them, uh, but they don't have inspired directives often, uh, but are aware of the SDI 
scenarios and the possibilities and want to do it, but the other priorities, as mentioned before, are first of all leading their daily work. There was already mentioned uh, with the previous speaker, the IHO and the MSDI working groups. I'm not going to talk much about, much about that, but the IHO is doing something about SDI. So we have the MSDI working group, which I is a member of too, and I also have also something called capacity building, and capacity building has traditionally been done for uh, cartography and hydrography, but it's looking more on SDI too. So ISO certainly recognizes this, and the workshops that have been given around the world touches items like policies, technique, and so on to inform and help these hydrographic organizations about establishing and being part of the SDI. Now, it has been, there's been a lot of these uh, working groups, and it has included a lot of people from many different organizations, as you can see, different countries around the world. So the MSDI is certainly out there, and they are certainly think about it, and more importantly, they are doing about something about it um, in slightly different flavors and slightly different ways, typically in different places. So talking about IHO, I thought it might be worth mentioning something called S102. So I know at previous Inspire conferences there's been presentation about IHO S100. And the first product specification that IHO made under the S100 umbrella is the uh, S102 um, product specification. It's a bathymetric navigational surface, basically. It's using something called a attributed grid. BAG, and this data is encoded in something called HDF5. Now, I'll get back to that in, in a few minutes. Um, this data is intended, as I said, for navigational use, and it allows some additional things. So besides having a coverage of the seabed, it has, for instance, also information about the uncertainty, the accuracy on the individual grids or the digital depths in that seabed coverage. And it includes some digital, digital signatures. Now, this is made to allow to distribute and use high density bathymetry, which is needed for within hydrography, for, for pilot organizations, and for navigation and, and other purposes. And it provides, compared to a traditional nautical chart, a lot more information. And one of the use cases that have been considered for a long time is, for instance, having this attributed grid on top of a vector chart and basically giving a full coverage, detailed picture of the seabed in 3D. So it's not just an image, it's actually a reference image with depth, with uncertainties. Um, and there are even for pleasure boats these days, small system that shows this type of data, not exactly this data, but this type of data in 3D for the mariners. As you can see, a full coverage picture of the seabed. Now that leads me then to WCS. So the web coverage service is not something that uh, originally was part of Inspire, but it is something that the hydrographic community is using for bathymetric data. And, uh, some of the hydrographic organizations within Inspire are using this to, even under the Inspire umbrella, to make that data available. Because if you start downloading the huge amount of bathymetry we are talking about here, then the WFS stand, uh, protocol is simply not efficient enough. It's, it's, it's vector based, it didn't give you enough. Now, the web coverage service gives you that same picture as you had before, the, uh, the 3D. Uh, surface of the seabed as the S102 standard by ISO. And we also got here HDF. So the web coverage service is using the HDF format too, actually, as we saw back before, as one of the data delivery formats. Which takes me then into another and final example is the Belgium MSDI. And the Belgium MSDI have built up a portal. So they are meeting their Inspire requirements through this portal here, but actually also have their own uh, web portal, which you access to, for users to access their bathymetry and other data. Um, there's a fair amount of data they have here, and just hidden from this image here is the, the port of Antwerp. India's a long way in, and you'll see that on, on the following slide. And 
people can then, not like in New Zealand, go and download this for free, while well, they can if they are educational uh, or, or other non-profit organizations. Uh, other people have to pay for it per megabyte. But they can go in and they can extract a part of the data, and that data, which is again 3D bathymetry, can be downloaded at GeoTIFF, Backfiles, or ASCII data. So here we have a better picture of the entrance to Antwerp. And it's a long way in, as you can see, and it's very sandy. So the Belgium authorities, they survey this every day. And every seven days, they produce a complete new electronic chart for that area for the pilots. Now, the reason for that is that every centimeter you can go in with a deeper vessel, the more containers and others you can bring in. So if you add 30 centimeters in, on some ships, that can basically be 1,000 TEUs. So it's a make a big difference how deep it is. So they really go in and they make sure they, they know exactly the depths pretty much every day. And the pilots have with them a small handheld device that will use this data and will actually live get feed from the tidal stations. So their data will actually change on the fly for the pilots. So they really know when, where they can sail at what time of the day to get the biggest vessels into Port of Antwerp. Which then brings me to another example of that. Uh, this is a, a Canadian example, actually, of a web service and not, not, a, um, not a, a pilot uh, service, but a piece of information which is not allowed to be used for navigation, but actually show, and again, it's, it's using the back data we, we looked at before, and it's showing bathymetry together with electronic chart on a web portal. And they get live feeds from the tidal station and make new models, continuous new, new model of the seabed, which is live updated. So the mariners, for their information, not for the navigation officially, actually have a different bathymetry, a different view of the seabed, depending on what time of the day they are going through the river here. Which is something the hydrographic is in offices is interested in because of something called ENAV. And I, that's a completely different story. I won't get into that. Uh, it'll be a separate presentation. But basically bringing a lot of services together and make that available to the mariner. Again, looking at their core users. But there is probably more that the hydrographic offices can do. So this part here is maybe more a message to the hydrographic offices. They actually have a lot of information which they keep kind of for themselves. It's not really shared. Uh, some of it they are sharing, like ICE information, there are ICE services, uh, different organizations throughout the world are made, having ICE services and ICE electronic charts. But if you go in a bit, a bit deeper, then when they do their surveys, they create something called backscatter. Backscatter is basically the intensity of the echo sound, or bring back the intensity, and that can be used to classify what is on the seabed. It's used to classify, really, is it rocks, is it sand, what kind of seabed is it? Now, they use that for some individual points and so on, but in many cases, many hydrographic offices, that data never really leaves the archives. They also produce something called water columns, and the first presenter, that was you, you had on one of your slides actually water column data. And this is a huge amount of data. So when the hydrographic office go out and survey, they survey typically with a speed of five knots, which is really, really slow. It's about 10 kilometers per hour. And they have an echo sounder, which brings per hour hundreds of gigabytes of data. So they, they come home with a lot of data. If they collect the water column data too, which they can if they choose, then they double the amount of data. It's that dense. But some of them are doing it because it gives them a really good picture afterwards to go in when they are in doubt, going, actually going and look at the raw data. So some organizations have this data available somewhere in a dusty archive, typically. But maybe this data is of interest for others. Of course, more, more common and is also shared by, by some hydrographic offices is REC information. It's one of the more popular non-hydrographic uh, themes they have. And uh, I know our, our Dutch colleagues are sharing that with some of their other government organizations in the Netherlands. And, uh, but the, the end users are very interested in this too. The divers love this type of information. And maybe some of these things here, and uh, oceanography, well, ISO is working potentially on a new standard, a new product specification. Maybe ISO should be thinking about Inspire and some of the other things that was mentioned during today's presentations when they look about new product specifications. And this one should actually be earlier. Another thing they select when they do surveying is uh, the, water, the speed 
of, of the sound going through the border, which includes, for instance, they use salinity information to part of that. So they actually collect a lot of information which kind of they use for their operations. Now this is recognized by hydrographic offices largely, and they want to share this as much as they can. And the ISO is also recognizing this. And in two days, it is United Nations World Hydrographic Day, so it's a good shoot, it's almost on the day. And the theme from the IHO this year is hydrography much more than nautical charts. So clearly they are recognizing that there is more to it than just the hydrographic charts. Thank you very much. Thank you for this for this uh, nice overview about uh, international SDI, marine SDI. Any questions for the floor? Okay, then I, can I ask you something? Yes, sure. Before you leave. <laughs> I see that you mentioned about the IMO yeah. as 100 series, and they, they developed the first one. Well, IHO. IHO. Developed. IHO, yeah, yeah, yeah. You are right, you are right. So, uh, then, they, they will for sure they will cover all the maritime requirements, but uh, can you give me information if they are going to cover as well the mar marine requirements, some kind of the environment? Because I think I heard something they've been talking about as well like this. Well, I, sh I should not be one, the one giving you the answer <laughs> to that, but a bit of yes and no. So the ISO's product specification under, under the S100 umbrella, they are working on a few of them right now, which is like electronic chart, S101, S102, the bathymetry, uh, there is one for maritime boundaries, for instance, and more coming. The majority of them are not really about oceanography and, and, and maritime data, but there are some, if you talk maritime in a navigational sense, they are considering some of these. But how they will evolve, how fast, and so on, I, I cannot say. It's uh, to be seen still quite new. And uh, it is probably still with the classes of the hydrographic community to some degree. But ISO is talking to EU and, 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 and looking at Inspire and so on. But of course, they have to do that worldwide. So it's, it's a big task for a relative small organization as the ISO. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, another question? I was, thank you, I was just thinking, could, could you, do you have any view on, 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 on how far do we go as public, uh, as public institutions? I mean, we have a lot of data, and for our own purposes, we need to sort of, in, we need to, 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 to make data available, we need to make systems that can reuse data on cross issues, uh, and we need to make services for the, you know, for our tasks. Yeah. But where is it the same, but, but the, there, there need to be some distinction between what do we make of services for the public and, and what is done by private uh, private sector? D difficult question to answer. Um, I think a lot of the hydrographic office are really cut down workforce-wise and so economically, so often they can only do what they really have to do. Uh, so it's probably not very likely that they have the resources and maybe, and it's going to sound wrong, the talents, if you will. It's not their domain, maybe, to, to provide some of these end-user applications. So in that sense, maybe it makes more sense that they make the data available, follow the American model to some degree, make the data available as much as they can, and make the industry then make something out, some services out of it. But it's a, it's a difficult task for the hydrographic office, and they don't really, even make, making that level of data available for, for the industry is quite a lot of work actually to make these services available. So for now, when I'm out talking to them, I encourage them, well, at least for now, just to make sure you, you, you gather your metadata you, and you keep your metadata in a structured way. And once you, you have resources and technology, whatever, to make it available, at least you have the foundation, right? Don't throw data away now. Keep it, and then maybe tomorrow you'll have a chance to share it. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you a lot. Okay, and now we will change a little bit the program. Now it's coming Ellen Voss, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. 
Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, very happy that uh, that you're all here. And uh, sorry, can you? Yeah. Which one is yours? I'll start with a very dull slide. Um, I'm uh, Ellen Voss from the from the Netherlands Hydrographic Organization. So actually, it's it's perhaps quite nice that we swapped the the, the order, and I'm now after uh, Peter Schwarzberg, who explained more about hydrographic offices and what 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 we do, because I will not go into uh, into that so deeply. Actually, what I will do um, is tell you. A love story. So it will be a little bit of a different format, um, and it's a, a story about Marina and Geo. And Marina stands for the the, the sea community uh, and HOs in particular, and Geo more for Inspire, um, SDI, um, land mapping agencies, and so on. So actually. Let me tell you a little bit more about uh, about Marina and Geo. Uh, Geo actually, yeah, he has quite a close relationship with uh, with e-government, um, general IT. Uh, he has yeah quite some money, and and lots of friends at uh, at higher higher places at a policy level. And Marina, she's different. She has a lot of international friends. And her friends understand her better than Geo does. So that sometimes will give her a, a bit of attention. Especially when Marina's friends leave and Marina is alone again with uh, Geo and his friends who drink all the beer. And, and she pities herself and she just locks herself in the kitchen and won't come out and be. <laughs> so Geo told Marina, uh, well, actually. You know what's your problem? You're never there when I need you. But, you know, it's quite understandable. Uh, Peter already touched a little bit on it. Uh, the IHO is a, is, an, is a worldwide organization, but it's just a small umbrella organization over these hydrographic offices. So they don't have a lot of money. And there are actually two big branches in, in the IHO. Uh, one is on the, on the left-hand side which is all about technique, standardization, and does a really, really good work, very profound work, um, and also a regional coordination side. But the problem is, Inspire just falls in between. For IHO, Inspire is a reg regional issue. So actually the people who are dealing over here with, with um, making these uh, these standards, updating standards, and developing S100, uh, they're even not allowed to put a lot of effort in Inspire. Because otherwise Canada will start to complain or somebody else will start to complain, you know, because it's a regional issue. But at the regional side, it's all uh, organized around sea basins, like the Baltic Sea, uh, the North Sea, the Mediterranean, uh, and Arctic. So, uh, so, but there's no standardization capacity at this side of the uh, of the IHO. <coughs> so that's why we really have a problem with getting Inspire and the IHO standardization people getting into sync. And actually, I don't know how to uh, how to solve this problem. Actually, they're just from different planets. So. Marina has a different history than, uh, than Geo. She has had the same friends for, for ages, and she updated her products a little bit, but still rather recognizable. Um, her friends and Marina, they agreed to use S57, which is the language to produce these electronic navigational charts. But, and, and even, even her Chinese friends understand this. So sometimes they, they, they have a problem in communicating, the Chinese and Marina, but, but then still they will even understand it because of the, they use the same symbology. And they will still be able to understand each other. But Geo is not interested at all in learning S57 or meeting Marina's friends. 
Marina's ancestors, they were fishermen. They lived off the sea, had a free life, but always very strict rules on safety. When Marina was a small child, she always had to wear a life vest. But Gio's grandparents, they, are, they used to be farmers. And they had to increase the size of their, uh, of their farm to stay alive. And they knew their property exactly. Where to grow maize, where to put the sheep, where to put the cattle. And they had exchanged the orchard with the neighbors in, uh, for ex to exchange for some more land to put some more sheep. And Gio was very proud of their properties. And Gio really doesn't understand why Marina doesn't know her property so well. She cannot tell him exactly how much fish there is in the sea, how much area, what the, what, how deep it is, and stuff like that. Where, where which places are useful for, uh, for windmills, etc. But if you see a picture like this, you can, you can uh, get a clue why this is. Here somebody is getting a, a, a sample with a Van Veen hopper. <laughs> Van Veen hopper, I don't know. Van Veen grabber, I think, would be the uh, good English uh, word. And it's a lot of work just to get a, a sediment sample. And it takes a lot of ship's time, which is, which is very expensive, like 1,000 euros an hour. So you can imagine it's a completely different story than just taking a sample of the sediment on the land side. And also, uh, collecting bathymetry is also uh, very new to, to GEO. And here you see the bathymetry data of the, of the Netherlands. And it's, it's quite... I think it's more or less what we, uh, what we have put out as a WCS, as uh, Peter just explored, uh, explained. Um, and the way we collect these data, you can, you can even recognize some of the fairways, the deep water routes and, uh, and the traffic separation schemes uh, on the water. So, so we will uh, address these more often than other parts that, for example, are deeper. Uh, so quite safe to, to, to sail on anyway. Um, and also very close to the coast, you will find quite a lot of gaps because it's just too difficult in the surf zone to collect proper bath bathymetry. Also the dynamics of the, of the seafloor, you, you can see some of these sand waves in this area and in this area can be a reason to go there more often. But it's good to know that the resolution of the data uh, at hydrographic offices databases ha doesn't have an equal resolution all over the database, all over the area, and can have really big holes. And also, <coughs> Marina throws all the data away, the backscatter that's not needed for navigation. Although some of Geo's new friends would love to use the data. But well, to Marina it just means more costs, more headaches, so she just throws it away. And then the financial crisis struck their relationship. So they come into a big crisis and they have to go back. Why, why are they even fallen in love in the first place? Well, actually it's just because they cannot live without each other. And here you see even a high level UN commission, the UNGJM, also has been mentioned before. Um, who made an overview on this? There are many issues, but land and sea are inseparable in the coastal area. And you really need a common holistic approach to deal with these issues. For example, every spatial plan really has an impact uh, on the marine side. Here you see uh, the expansion of the Rotterdam uh, harbor with the Maasvlakte 2. And it really, it's, it's this area, and it really has a big influence on the, on the maritime limits. So it even has consequences for what the state of the, the Netherlands can, can do, because the EEZ will change shape. And also it has consequences, for example, for fisheries. So, what else do Geo and, and Marina need? Actually, they need two things. They also, they, they can deal with all their problems together, but it's even better to get their friends involved and to make it a common thing. Um, and actually what they need is also a common dream. 
So what they ran into is a, is, is a, is a wreck of an old ship. And perhaps people will not recognize it, but it was, this was the, the Barcantina Loa, on which we had the workshop on Monday. Um, and it was found as an old wreck. But together with their friends, Marina and Gio have big plans to, to start and renovate it. So, so this is what they need, a big dream um, and friends with different skills. Some are good at technique, some are good in planning, some have, uh, good, are good in uh, PR, others have, uh, are good in fundraising. So, so they, they start to organize uh, nice barbecues and, uh, and working sessions to work on, the, on this shared dream, to put the old wreck back into a beautiful tall ship in full glory. So, and actually, Gio promises to learn a bit of S57 and spend some time with uh, Marina's friends as well. And here I, I will have to explain this picture a little bit. On the left hand side you find the, the, the triangle of, uh, of, of, st of standards. Uh, it's it's the, actually the Dutch geospatial framework. So we have in the middle we have the geospatial, national geospatial model. It's based on ISO and you have different domain models and exchange is, is possible because it has the same basis. And here is our Netherlands Hydrographic Office database. And you see a big wall in between because we speak S57 and it doesn't connect to the triangle on the left hand side. And actually you can draw a same triangle with uh, Inspire or something else. And actually what, what, what is very nice is that um, instead of S57, nowadays we are starting to have S100, at least with the same ISO basis. So the barrier is already getting smaller. And if GEO is starting to learn S57 as well, this will really start to help. And then you can start to, oh, oops, 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 oh my. And, and then you can really lower this wall and make mappings in between them. Okay, but, but still not all the problems are solved because Geo can get very annoyed with Marina because she always comes up with problems that never used to exist before and then he just thinks, well, she should solve them. So, for example, each of us 89 she tries to convince him to use this instead of the national geodetic framework that always used to be fine with everybody. He cannot even pronounce it properly. And not even to mention LAT. He always thought it stood for a living apart together. But now <laughs> she explained that it's actually lowest astronomical tide because vertical at sea, yeah, what, 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 what is it? It's, but, well, during the work and the barbecues, Marina and Gio really discovered that they also have a lot of common friends, friends in common. So, some from the area of standardization, some industry, oil, um, and even, even, even more industry, academia, and even some European um, programs. So actually, Geo discovers there's really more to marina than just nautical charts. And together they find new ways into the future. So we continue. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen, for this, I would say, very nice presentation. Any questions? like uh, marine spatial planning, uh, EMOTnet perhaps. Um, <laughs> I think they will become more beautiful when they stay together. <laughs> okay, thank you Ellen. Now, let's, let's put the...
is it first? Yeah. This one? Yeah. Okay, we will just launch it from here. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yes. Now we can continue. Yeah. Esben, you have a floor. My name is Esben Munch Sørensen. Thanks to Ellen for introducing these two uh, persons. I think I'll uh, refer to them in my uh, presentations because I have known both of them for years. And it's fascinating to see how Marina is facing uh, the history, is facing the challenges in the same way like Dio did 30 years ago. On the other hand, it's really fascinating to realize that Dio has really to learn from Marina in relation to other issues. So, the, uh, and the challenge is, therefore I like your presentation very much, to, to cooperate, to communicate, and to uh, find new solutions in, in partnerships. And it's really a big task to bring these worlds together. And uh, we, in our workshop we discussed very much how can we share experiences into uh, different areas. My name is uh, Esp Mokshans, and I'm coming from, oh, from a research group. Just remember this, blue.co, because we have set up a research group uh, dealing with, um, dealing with uh, blue governance, because the challenge is governance. Governance has to be the way, and, the, and we have to follow in studying uh, the, the relation between the uh, marine and the um, uh, marina and the gear world in my and my experience is that I'm both um, my research have been developed on the black side and now we are moving into the uh, blue area but anyway uh, my remember my uh, message when leaving you have uh, pr probably heard lots of presentations here but my very short message about the marriage to um, for marina and you in the future is sharing and zoning. Sharing and zoning is two very simple words, but they reflect both a technology and a method and a way of doing partnership. So I'll discuss sharing and zoning in my uh, presentation. Uh, that's the, that's a, uh, the department who hosts the Congress uh, or the conference here in Aalborg, Department of Development and Planning placed in the harbor front of Aalborg, where we had the workshop. That is the outline of what I'm going to say. And sharing information and zoning in spatial legal rights, restrictions and recommendations in sea use is in fact my message. We have to combine these two <coughs> world of knowledge and methods in the way we uh, handle the challenge of MSP and the integrated uh, marine management at seaside. So let's just make a, a short introduction sitting at landside looking at seaside. We are sitting in a house looking at the sea and looking at our, uh, it's very easy to meet the service of marine traffic. Maybe it's not very well, well known on land for land researchers or land managers, but on seaside it's a very essential tool. You get information about all to, uh, units m moving around the seaside and you can get information about this on your mobile phone. You can uh, bring information further and ask for the individual objects, getting uh, more detailed information from the unit in your, in your, on your smartphone or uh, on your uh, screen, desktop or whatever it is, get information about all this stuff. All this individual uh, data can be uh, analyzed and brought into um, analyze environments, meaning that one data become uh, into the right environment a uh, part of crowdsourcing. And this is in fact a crowdsourcing map we see here where all the individual AIS information is uh, connected, analyzed and visualized. What I want to tell here is in fact that Marina has a very developed uh, technical level in communication between different uh, uh, environments. Even though we normal, when we are in Geo's uh, partnership, we, th we look at, at Mar uh, Marina's world as a closed silo. But on our, these technological issues, they are very advanced. 
and sharing is in fact uh, what we are talking about here. And this slide shows a picture of how we can start up sharing. Uh, and what you see here is in fact that most of the traffic in Denmark is passing through nature 2,000 areas. The, uh, the, the, some of the uh, areas shown here is nature 2,000 areas protected in to some extent, but it's also highways for, for marine traffic. And uh, pictures of these showing the value of, of sharing because it creates new knowledge and thinking about how we have to deal with different issues. So what we realize is that on, in Marina's world there is uh, many user-generated data already existing. The basic uh, data for identification in the AIS is both very simple, but it's also a crowdsourcing uh, methodology used in diff for different purposes. And AIS is linking the physical world with the virtual world. That's what, in fact, we in many other issues of the geospatial revolution is facing. That is to bring the, um, uh, the, uh, world, the virtual world and the physical world together. And one of the former speakers, Peter, told about the pilot near Antwerpen. What he was, in fact, doing, he has a very updated, real-time updated model of the, uh, of the bathymetric model uh, updated daily. To, to supervise uh, the captain on the ship. So we, Marina is not only old-fashioned sea chart. Marina is a world of really professional, updated and distributed uh, data uh, used for uh, many purposes. And the point is that this technology will be made very useful for in Geo's world because collecting uh, real-time data in monitoring many issues is the challenge for very much of the uh, uh, land side geo community and for the inspire world uh, too because it's it's, it's very often still uh, it's not uh, real time uh, data so it is thinking uh, in new ways when talking about uh, sea, land uh, sea use there's a potential in linking uh, uh, data uh, uh, from vessels uh, into this world. So vessels are in fact a um, great opportunity to cr create a new uh, data set for purposes uh, related to uh, Geos world, environmental monitoring and um, updating uh, different uh, maps uh, at seaside can be much is very easy, in fact, because vessels are information producers. Many of necessary information are already produced at the daily life at, uh, at a ship. But as Ellen said, uh, Marina and her friends throw away what is not necessary for navigation. But if we share this information and open our minds from landside to seaside, what in fact is being produced on daily life on the bridge, you can, uh, it will open a world of val uh, data which can be value added to dedicated uh, uh, purposes in relation to environmental management. And furthermore, we, there is an already existing infrastructure to capture data from, uh, for new purposes like uh, temperature, like heel clearance, like um, um, different types of uh, um, environmental monitoring. So there's really a new world uh, racing on the, uh, in the future. What is the drivers? What has been taking place on land side? We have, through the last uh, decades, made this geospatial revolution. And what, it, what today's agenda is about sharing data. Um, 30 years ago, it was creating the first level of vector maps, and in, to some extent, that's what have still existing on the ECDIS map, we are still using vector data and operating the necessary safety operations on a very, uh, what we can call, um, uh, low MIPS using community because handling vector data requires much less MIPS, that means million instructions per second, and that's necessary because the communication structure at seaside is not based on broadband but on narrow uh, channels. So, uh, in fact, there is limitation on seaside to use 
the advanced technologies integrated in the multimedia-based uh, internet uh, solutions on land side integration. But we are looking into a future where also broadband will revolutionize the communication at seaside. So therefore there will be a lot of, because we are facing new uh, satellite uh, trans uh, communication systems at seaside. So uh, data sharing will be a uh, much uh, bigger issue uh, at seaside and they will not they will stop doing like Marina did, showing, uh, showing away what's necessary, uh, what's not necessary for navigational purposes. And what a navigator is today, he is in fact looking at many different screens, collecting data, and now we understand why uh, Marina uh, acts like, like she does, because it's so confusing with all these uh, different screens and paper uh, books where she has to register her data. And all the data is just thrown away when it has been uh, uh, controlled, and uh, but creating a more uh, sharing data community on board the vessel opens up quite new solutions and using the, uh, a data cloud to, uh, uh, to store it and to register it and to uh, communicate it will open quite new uh, challenges. And that's in fact what has already happened at Landside. That's what inspires about and what has been the situation uh, using cloud technologies in uh, distributing geospatial information. So here we can see that Marina has really a lot to learn from Geo. The need is necessary. We know now that uh, pollution is raising. Just to have some pictures of what it's all about. It's about uh, managing uh, the marine resources. We have recreational and small scale uh, fishing as new uh, expanding stakeholders. We have sustainable energy uh, asking for uh, areas and space at seaside and it's not coordinated. We need the MSP concept. We have the fuel energy and the transportation systems at seaside which has totally changed the international uh, trade. Biodiversity and habitats need to be protected. And it's really a big uh, challenge for mamas and for, at sea for many uh, types of fish, how to protect them uh, in the future. Um, we have multifunctionality in harbor areas. Uh, tourists, uh, citizens are moving into the uh, wet areas in the inner cities, uh, the former good uh, harbor areas, and they are given uh, multi-recreational uh, purposes, even though they are still managing as uh, harbor areas, seaside areas. Flooding, grounding and catastrophes ask for integrated solutions. And therefore there is a need for planning and coordination. And marine administration today have many actors uh, in play. It is just a great challenge of coordination and especially a lack of data infrastructure. That's why we, are discuss we can discuss how can uh, seascaping environment le learn from landscaping. And uh, the question is, like the agenda today, and more integrated uh, spatial data infrastructure focusing on the, what, you are, uh, what the other speakers have been doing. Um, and land ad why I'm then talking about land administration system, that's because it, ha it uh, has a cadastral component. And if you look at seaside and landside, it's in fact the same situation. It's a, it's a community. But uh, the, the borders are different. The marina lives in an international community where everything is regulated by IMO, uh, SOLAS, and international law and con convention. Why Diego, he is a multi-ethnic a uh, person with many different national traditions on this issue. But basically it's the same. It's about organizing a spatial, uh, space community based on rights, restrictions and responsibilities at land side. While on sea side we have the same. If you, interpret, if you take a sea chart and analyze it on all the data behind, it's a question about rights, restrictions and recommendations. But Marina is a little bit ahead uh, for you because she had a long tradition for 
including the, the third dimension. And in fishery, they have been working with the fourth dimension for, for many years because they have time-limited permissions uh, in fishery. <coughs> so, but the point is, thinking about sp these spatial legal objects, and based on the cadastral thinking, we have a, 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 something to bring into the discussion about marine management, the discussion about uh, <coughs> multi-purpose cadastral systems, which have been developed for hundreds of years in, uh, on land side, but not at the same time in the international management of the sea resources uh, uh, in, in the international community. But some of our colleagues in, in the world discuss it. Uh, Canada talks about marine cadaster. US talk about marine cadaster. Marine cadaster is very useful to describe this spatial community at seaside. Normally, we just try as living on the uh, land side is looking at the sea as something where, which have one, uh, one height and it relates to the uh, system uh, at, uh, at land side. But the, the ocean is much more complicated and much more dynamic like, like we heard uh, Marina uh, tells bef tell before that uh, tides, um, different uh, uh, movements of sediments does the community at seaside much more active and we have no uh, fulfilled picture of what sort of community uh, marina is living in because mar marina is in fact the, not the right name because she should maybe have called Martina, Maritina and not marina because this thinking of the distinction between the two words maritime and marine there's a huge difference, even though many translators misunderstand the, the difference, because maritime, that's a commercial use of, of the sea. That's related to navigation, to transportation, all this. While marine is related to the mar existing of marine resources in a much more broad sense. So what's the name of, of marina? Maybe you should be open-minded to take a, a name too, uh, a family name called marina, now Ma Ma Martina, or change it in some way. What's her birth name? Maybe her, her first name must be Martina, and her family name <laughs> must be Marina, because that's more broad and include all the aspects, uh, and not only navigation, uh, as she has been focusing on. But anyway, it is, uh, Seaside is a very complicated uh, community, and uh, it's a big challenge for us to, to model it, because we are moving with uh, uh, stationary models and not reflecting the time dynamics and the, the, um, the nature resource dynamic at seaside. Uh, the, then I'm a little bit, uh, I'll just say a few words. What is in fact the Inspire Marine data set? That's the yellow one. That's the energy resources, the mineral resources, the oceanic, which and all these yellow data set have to be integrated in the next round of the uh, INSPIRE process. I will not go into deep with this issue because the, the audience uh, know it. Uh, but my point is that uh, we have the solution is marine spatial planning. Uh, it is a public process of analyzing and allocating the spatial and temporal uh, distribution of human activities to achieve ecological, economic, and social objective that are usually specified through a political process. That's a definition of it. And it has to be done uh, over the next uh, um, uh, years to come. I think it's, it will be about, the plans have to be finalized in 2016. Uh, but it is important values. And uh, in some areas, space and time uh, and uh, is uh, necessary in relation to natural resources. Just see this picture and see how a highway for animals in the future might change to a highway for uh, commercial ships. I, we talk about the, the change in the, in the Arctic environments. Uh, so we have some areas who have a uh, high value of uh, ecological values, and they have to be protected into some ways. We have others where they are of 
high economical values. And it has to be solved by spatial, marine spatial planning. That's the only solution. And it is a, an, an integrated, multi-objective, strategic and future-oriented process. And it has, of course, to be a continuing, not ending at the moment, and adaptive. And it has to be participatory because we are facing a, a very complex community at seaside. And it has written in a directive to be uh, based on the marine uh, strategy uh, directives idea about an eco-based system. And it can be done. Just to, uh, this is my description of what's going on in Denmark. We have the silos on, on seaside, which are uh, seven, eight authorities working together uh, in traditional ways by informal hearings, yes, I'm finally realizing now, but the, the solution for these uh, <coughs> uh, partnership in practice is uh, to, to make integrated multisectoral marine spatial planning, but the basic, to, to realize it, you need the marine spatial data infrastructure. And you can describe it like here more technically and how how it is organized, MSP and MSD, in a total integrated concept reflecting what's going on in the uh, actual uh, process of uh, uh, bringing in data sets in the INSPIRE uh, process. More generally, the INSPIRE process needs to, uh, to, to set some questions how to capture user-generated data. It is a challenge like thinking in the vessel as a wind, uh, sensor, but also other types of data you generated by the uh, user community might have an influence or have to be registered. How to locate and find hidden knowledge uh, in uh, how to understand and decide the difference between dynamic and permanent zoning. It's really a complex issue when we are talking about uh, uh, creating uh, the, data mod uh, the data models. And we have also to realize that planning and data models is a mirror of the power balance um, between the involved stakeholders. And therefore we have of course discussed how to map my minorities living in the coastal communities. How are they um, described and giving rights in the community and what is fishery and what is the difference between fishery and fishing. That is more open question, so I hope that I uh, give the audience more uh, questions than answer uh, with my presentation. Thank you for the, your attention. Thank you a lot for your presentation. I think you point out some very important issues. Any question from the floor? Maybe I can give you one. Yeah. You said that for many of issues, what you mentioned that marine spatial planning, it's a way. Yeah. And do you think the directive which is proposed from Digimare, yeah. directive of maritime spatial planning, it's a good step forward? Yeah. I don't know if you're aware. They they launched. <coughs> They give it a proposal in 2013? Yes, I know the proposal and how it has been changed from the, in the beginning process. It also includes integrated uh, uh, coastal management and it was taken out of the, uh, the proposal to the directive. And on the other hand, one, you can say that it was, it, it's a shame, but it was also necessary because of the fact mentioned by uh, my, uh, Ellen before, all these different in the coastal administration, just looking at the Nordic countries, for example, we have different administrative structures uh, in the coastline because the water near the coastline is in Denmark administrated by the state uh, agency except areas in the harbors which are totally independent. And if you go to Norway and Sweden, the municipality or the regional authorities are influenced, have the power to decide what's going on in the water side of the near coastal zone. So, and looking out in, in, in Europe, it becomes very complicated. So I think it was necessary at this stage uh, of, uh, of the developing of integrated um, uh, marine management, but in the future, it is necessary 
to bring it in. It was necessary to take it out, but in the future it will be necessary to bring it in again. But it needs more harmonization on the, on the governance side. Thank you a lot. Yeah. Okay, I think. Oh, there is another. Wait, it's it's recorded. So. Professor, uh, thank you for this presentation. How how important, uh, in your view, is Inspire for establishing this cross land sea marine spatial planning uh, platform? I think, uh, as I, uh, if the marine. MSDI can be uh, brought to a, success, to a success based on the index data. Now I think it will be an important step forward because uh, there, if we just uh, uh, are able to bring in the yellow data set in a successful way, we have an important uh, we have done an important step. And then of course um, uh, the the influence of the maritime sector with all the real-time data procedures for capturing and analyzing and visualizing can be an important tool to, to add value to this MSDI, uh, uh, to analysis based on the SD, marine SDI. So I think, and in the first step we have to accept what is going on, but be very open-minded to the uh, richness of uh, data in the in the maritime sector and to the potential in the maritime sector of being um, efficient and more covering uh, data sensors. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any more? I think we can finish with this session. Thank you, Esben, very much. Yeah. We heard some. Yeah. Please. So thank you a lot, and continue. we can continue in the 11, which is now. <laughs>